I'm here with John Huntsman Sr., one of the world's greatest philanthropists and business leaders. Welcome. Thank you, Adam. Talk to us about the story behind your book, Barefoot to Billionaire. How did you go from literally having nothing to running the world's largest chemical corporation? Well, through a lot of luck and through, uh, through uh, uh, the ability to surround myself with many people who had talents and abilities uh, different and in many cases far better than my own, and uh, being a risk taker and uh, putting everything on the line time and time again because I believed in myself, believed in my team, believed in the products that we were producing and manufacturing, and uh, because it's a lot of fun. And, uh, and, uh, and I knew that uh, if we were successful, we could, uh, we could make other people successful and happy and, and uh, bring about some of the sorrows and heartaches that uh, correct some of those in some people's lives that we'd had in our own lives. So there were a lot of deep meanings behind it, but most importantly was an opportunity to keep driving and driving and never giving up. And what were the biggest lessons that you learned along the way? Are there assumptions that you held about leadership or business that you thought were true and turned out to be false? Uh, to some extent, I found that academically, uh, it really didn't matter whether I had received a certain grade in a class. It didn't matter too much about uh, what schools one attend. I know that I shouldn't say that at Wharton. What matters, I think, is, uh, is one's uh, drive, one's uh, intelligence with respect to uh, quantitative areas. I think you have to understand math and, 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 um, and, and, and uh, quantitative type mindset to out-negotiate your opponents because I never have used computers or calculators. I've always been able to figure out in my head far before my opposition has in negotiating for acquisitions where we need to be and what the numbers are and, and, and how we could get, uh, get the best side of the bargain without having to resort to accountants or assistants or financial experts. And so I've been blessed with, with that good uh, luck, if, if you will. But most importantly, I think never giving up uh, believing in yourself and believing in your product. And uh, there are very, very few true entrepreneurs. Most people uh, give it a shot for a year or two and then go to work for somebody else and say, I'm an entrepreneur who didn't make it. They're really not entrepreneurs. On true entrepreneurs have to really uh, 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 forego almost everything. They have to put it all on the line. They have to go through tremendous downswings and still come back fighting and swinging. You have to know what it means to come out of the valleys of death and still be successful and keep, uh, keep a positive attitude and always make your team around you feel like you're succeeding, even though you know way down deep it's a long shot. You have to be the fighter and the leader and the one who, uh, who, who, who instills energy and hope in others. Do you have any favorite practices for instilling energy and hope and, and sort of especially when, when things are down and people are struggling, helping people regain their confidence? Well, I've always believed the glass was half full, is half full, and, uh, uh, and perhaps was born sunny side up. And therefore, I look at the good and the positive in everything we're doing, and there always is some aspect of good, goodness, and some positive element to a successful acquisition or a successful business. And so you build on the successes. The successes may only be 20 or 25 or 30 percent of the total mix, but you build on those successes so that you don't concentrate and focus on the negative. And I think that's helped immensely to have that basic thought process going through the organization or, or the group of people you're working with. One of your early successes was the clamshell container that many of us have eaten Big Macs out of from McDonald's. Uh, was, was that a milestone in your career, and, and how did it shape what came next? Well, it really wasn't. I, we first invented the uh, plastic plates, bowls, and dishes, and, and the takeout food containers, and egg cartons, and meat trays. I'd go through grocery store aisles and look at everything made of paper and glass and say some days these could be made out of plastic, and of course, we ended ma manufacturing products out of plastic 30 years ago and are now into very sophisticated composite plastics for airlines and automobiles and bicycles and, and paint and rubber and 
cosmetics and soap and detergents and electronics and medical supplies and pharmaceuticals. And, but in the early days, uh, the Big Mac container was quite successful in the sense that McDonald's overwhelmed me with orders and it caused us to build several new plants here and in Europe. And uh, it was uh, obviously the first breakthrough from paper which cost twice as much. It leaked, it used more energy, its uh, biodegradable abilities were, were the same as plastic. When you put anything under dirt, they don't biodegrade anyway, no matter what it's made out of. And it, it, it allowed the products to stay fresher longer so they could produce more of them before lunch and move, move m many more products off the shelf. So it was really uh, in, in that era in 1973-74, it was a great breakthrough in fresh foods and in keeping products fresher longer. And, and, uh, and today it has its upsides and its downsides environmentally. And uh, we uh, were great leaders in the areas of recycling and uh, reusing products and spent hundreds of millions of dollars to uh, build some of the greatest and largest recycling facilities. But today, for the last 25, 30 years, we've not been in those products, but they were, it was a great start. It was, I always told Dow Chemical when I was working for Dow before I started my own business 45 years ago that they should get into some of these products, but they were too large and bureaucratic, and, and to them, innovation and creativity just didn't exist. Today, there are partners in different products around the world, and, and uh, so life has changed. So in those early days, you also spent some time in the Richard Nixon administration. Right. What did you learn from that experience? Well, I learned uh, from the Richard Nixon administration a great deal of uh, information and knowledge about what I didn't want to do. Sometimes we have role leaders who teach us, by example, what to do. I found in my life that most of my leaders have taught me great examples of how I should do the opposite. or some uh, uh, aspect of what they are teaching uh, that uh, I didn't want to pursue, I would pick it up from their uh, characteristics. The president was a man of very fair uh, 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 mind, a very intelligent man, very gracious to the children. Uh, I was his executive assistant, staff secretary, and assistant to the president. And I found uh, President Nixon to uh, do some great things for America, the strategic arms limitation talks, open relationships with the, the Soviets for the first time in history, and Reagan later was able to capitalize on that. The uh, war on cancer on December 23, 1971, my mother just died of cancer. That meant a great deal to me, the, uh, the opening of relationships with the People's Republic of China. Unfortunately, there was another side to Richard Nixon, the cynical side, the dubious side, the more, uh, 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 oh, I want to say, uh, uh, it's hard to pick a word that doesn't uh, hurt somebody's image, but I think it was, it was uh, uh, a, a trick, a, a, a non, a non, uh, a positive side. It was more of a negative side. And I, I never worked with them. When I saw that side around me, it seemed like there was always a very professional approach. And, but from Bob Haldeman, who was his chief of staff, he was the one who implemented uh, a lot of Rich, Richard Nixon's negative uh, suggestions. And, and uh, Haldeman was a terrible role model. And from him, I learned what not to do. And I told him that when I left the White House. I said, you've given me the greatest lesson in how not to build a business, on how not to manage people, how not to treat people. And I want to thank you for this experience. That was our last days. So after he got out of prison and years later at Pat Nixon's funeral, I put my arms around him and gave him a hug and told him that uh, all was forgotten. And he said the same thing. And he died a few years later. Wow. Well, this, this is an example of something else I wanted to ask about, which is you're known by, I think, everyone who's interacted with you for having impeccable integrity and honesty. And I think that, that leads you to be willing to speak about some things that others perhaps are not. H how do you think about that? Um, you know, do, you, do you ever hesitate in a situation like that to speak your mind? No. You know, I think each one of us is born with a moral compass. And, and uh, some of us uh, have that at birth and others are taught that through uh, through schooling or through parentage, proper parentage. And in my case, it, it, uh, I, I felt very fortunate that I've known right from wrong. 
and I knew when Haldeman would tell me to do something and I wouldn't do it, that I could get fired, but I, I knew it was wrong. People know when they're doing something that's not right. Their moral compass tells each of us whether it's right or wrong. We don't need to, uh, uh, you know, spend a lot of time in classes and courses and studies about the difference between something that's uh, ethically or, or, or criminally or, 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 or morally wrong. And in my own mind, I just felt I would never do that in my life. It wasn't worth it. You know, I wanted uh, sons and daughters and a, and a lovely wife and a family and to be respected. And uh, when I was here at Wharton, I always found Wharton to be an enormous example of, uh, of, of strong moral values and, and, and honorableness and honesty and integrity. And I, I learned so much at, at Wharton and at Penn uh, from, uh, from my, you know, I was raised with nothing in, the, uh, in a rural farm community in Idaho. And I found this school to be a great school for ethics. Well, you've, you've certainly given us a shining example of that <laughs> as one of 19 people on earth who have ever given away over a billion dollars. Well, thank you. And we're obviously all, all grateful for that. Uh, it's interesting that this happened at a particular stage in your career when you had previously not really done much philanthropy and all of a sudden just giving and giving and giving. What caused the shift for you? Well, I think it was because as a young boy, I always would share what I had with my relatives who were, who were uh, without most everything. They, they were just, uh, most of them lived in a very small town, neither Idaho or Utah, and struggled to get by. They, they would be on the poverty level today, although believe it or not, they were all strong Republicans. Uh, but uh, I would share what little I had as a boy, and not much. They would share what little they had with me, which wasn't much. Maybe it was a pair of shoes, I remember one time they let me wear their, their uh, pocket watch to class, $1 pocket watch, which was a big deal for me. They let me drive their old pickup trucks, which taught me how to drive. They maybe were 12 or 15 years old. But we would share what little we had. And as I grew older and, and developed uh, wealth of, of a small amount, I would share it back with them, and I would begin to share it with others. I, all throughout my life, I, it's just been a matter of Ganging wealth so you could give it back. I've never thought about giving wealth away as uh, anything other than the normal and usual thing that individuals do. Never occurred to me that anybody would ever say, is that different or why do you do that or, or uh, other people don't do that. I just thought everybody did that. That, that was the way we were raised. You, you've gone to some unusual lengths, though, uh, taking out personal loans to fulfill charitable commitments, uh, voting against your own political party if there's another candidate right. who would fight cancer. Um, wh what is it that pushes you to give to that level? Well, I just think that uh, uh, people who, who have the means and don't share it with others are not particularly people that I enjoy being around. I, I think uh, the love of our brothers and sisters people of all races and backgrounds and ethnic groups. Uh, a wonderful Jewish family sent me to Penn. I'm a Mormon boy from the rural Idaho. They didn't ask my religion, and I've given over 5,000 scholarships. <clears throat> and I always think of them because they didn't ask me anything other than, you know, are you honest and have you done your best? And that's all I ask. And so they set a tone and a temperament uh, that uh, kind of allowed me to see a side of life that meant more to me than anything in the world. And so with others, I kind of copied them. <laughs> uh, you've, you've been awfully original for someone who claims to copy. I, I will yeah. say it's interesting that uh, when you went to, to talk about signing the Giving Pledge, uh, you had an objection to Warren Buffett that, <laughs> that few would have expected. <laughs> Uh, and you said, no, I, I don't think this pledge is right. Tell us about that. Well, Warren's always been a great friend. He's a, he's a wonderful American, and so is Bill Gates. And they give tremendous amounts, as you know, for malaria over in Africa and other diseases. They're just tremendous. But when Warren put together his group of originally 45 billionaires so that they could give 50% of their fortunes away, I thought to myself, well, that's the most unusual thing I've ever heard. Some of these people are worth $10 billion or $20 billion. If they lived on half of it, suppose they were worth 10, and they lived on $5 billion, that's really a struggle to get through life on $5 billion. And, and I'd been giving, you know, a good portion of 
whatever we'd made for years, maybe 25 or 30 years by the time the Giving Pledge was established about three or four years ago. And at our first meeting, we had, they all told up, stood up, and some of the folks said, well, you know, I gave $500,000 the other day. And somebody else would say, well, let me tell you my story about giving a million dollars away. And I thought, no, these, these folks are worth billions. What are they talking about, giving 1% or 2%? So I stood up in the back when it, just toward the end of the meeting. I said, you know, we ought to be ashamed of ourselves to be talking about giving 50% away. We should be giving 80% away, 90%. I mean, how much does it take us to put food on our table and the necessities of life and live a comfortable life and have everything we really need and other people and other organizations and sick people and people need the money and we don't. Why don't we make it 80 percent? Warren said, John, sit down and be quiet. <laughs> let's, get, let's get them up to 5 percent and then 10 percent and then 50 percent. And, uh, you know, not all of us started out uh, like you did where, you know, you didn't where you where you've always given and I have all my life when I was making $300 a month as a young naval officer I was giving $50 a month to a family down the street who needed it more than I did in addition to my 10% tithing to my church but but it was just it was just part and parcel of who you are and what your values are well, it's, it's been a tremendous example for us all to learn from and uh, thoroughly enjoyed reading Barefoot to Billionaire, full of, of stories of not only great honesty and integrity, but also some great pranks. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's a great honor to be back at Penn. The honor is ours. Thank you.